like you, you are not like me. It looks like you are superficial. It looks like you are a man of the world, a woman of the world. And I have something that will take me to heaven. And you want to take that thing away from me? No way. Because I've committed, consecrated everything to the Lord. That is the man, that is the woman that overcomes. Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Uh, look at verse 9. It says in verse 9, whom resist steadfast in the faith. You resist with all, your, with all the energy of God. You receive with all the vigilance you've got. You receive with all the power that you've got. It says you receive steadfast in the faith. You are standing. You are steadfast in the faith. And you receive that tempter. And receive that temptation. The tempters are devious. They're dangerous. They're crafty. They're evil. And if you don't understand, they'll take you other ways. Whom resisted first in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at practical repentance of deadening temptations with brokenness. Deadening temptations. There are some temptations that deadening people not only that they allure you into evil entice you into evil you become deadened to the voice of the lord and the voice of the savior and to the warning that he had given you he had given us in the past you know when, when something happens and uh, you know the flesh is attracting that thing the flesh is accepting you know, that thing and it deadens your mind. You even forget all the warnings you have heard. You forget all the words of God that you have heard. You forget all the consecrations you have made. You forget all the things you have penned down and you have said, no, that will not happen again. I'll not give myself to that again. And then the temptress comes or the tempter comes or the temptation comes. You're dead in. You don't even have a feeling that anything is going on. We need, and if you have fallen, if you have gone astray, we need practical repentance of dead knee temptations with brokenness. You are broken, and you come to the Lord with a broken heart. It's not like, you know, okay, God, I'm sorry, and then you are smiling. I'm sorry I did that thing again. You're a loving God. You're a merciful. You're not broken. You'll do that thing again. You'll go that way again. You'll eat that thing again. You'll drink that thing again. Because you are not broken. And the repentance is not deep in your heart. The repentance is not deep enough for God to see that you are breaking away from that thing. Look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 9. It says now, I rejoice, not that she were made sorry, but I rejoice because ye sorrowed to repentance. Ye sorrowed to repentance. You know, some people uh, ask, oh, what's the difference between the so-called salvation of today and the salvation of yesteryears? The, the difference is, you know, there are people, they hear about Christ and they say that's the gospel. They hear there's no repentance. They don't understand the evil of sin. They don't understand the perdition, the punishment that comes as a result of sinning. And so they just hear that Jesus down the cross of Calvary and you want to be saved where you raise up your hand and they raise up their hands. In their heart, they don't understand the evil is sinning. And then they say, well, write down their name and then they go, I'm born again, I'm born again. And then they go out, the same temptations come from the people who want them to smoke marijuana or smoke whatever. And they didn't have any understanding of real salvation. Although they claim to be saved, they go back right into that thing. It's a woman of the world that approaches them in their office after they say they are born again. 
there is no understanding of the brokenness that a person ought to have because of that they just fall but those who got saved many years ago like when we got saved we understood that sin is evil that sin is terrible that if you live in sin and you die in that condition you go to hell and we had a clear picture of hell of what hell was we were broken and we cry it's not the tears it's the heart that we're talking about that is broken we repented like that and we knew what repentance actually meant that's why we've remained saved after all these many years it says now i rejoice not that ye were made sorry but that she sorrowed to repentance for ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing look at verse 10 it says in verse 10 for godly sorrow walketh repentance that's true repentance you're so sorry that you did that thing, it's not that you know that you say you are saved and you are, you know, relating what you used to do, you are relating it with joy, with glee. You are telling the people, you know, I used to do that, and men and women, I used to catch them, I used to do it this way and do it that way, and, and you are relating it with joy. It's like you're saying the good old days as a sinner. You have not repented if you have repented you have godly sorrow that works repentance to salvation not to be regretted of not to be repented of but the sorrow of the world walketh death we're looking at psalm 51 in psalm 51 we're reading from verse 16 this is the chapter where David prayed in repentance and look at this for thou desirest not sacrifice else would I give it thou delightest not in bunch offering look at verse 17 in verse 17 the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart O God thou wilt not despise when a person is repenting he has broken heart he has sorrow in the heart he says how could i do that this is shameful this is terrible this is going to earn me eternal punishment and judgment and the heart is broken and then you repent that's how to overcome those deadening deadening uh, temptations look at uh, matthew i'm looking at chapter 26 you know the story already uh, peter denied the lord and eventually when christ looked back at him look at verse 75 in verse 75 uh, it says and peter remembered the word of jesus do you remember the words of jesus in the office do you remember the words of Jesus in your community? When you go to be with your people, your relatives that are not born again, even those who are born again, but maybe they are superficial, maybe like the modern day believers that do not have the depth of understanding of the word of God. When you are with them, do you remember the word of the Lord? Do you remember everything you have learned? We just finished the retreat, December, and we just finished the GCK in December. And then all the messages we have been hearing that will give us real conviction, fiery conviction. Do you remember when you get back home and uh, Peter remembered? Actually, Peter remembered at the wrong time. It was almost getting too late. It was when uh, that lady said, you must be one of them. He should have remembered that if you deny me here on earth, I'll deny you before the angels of God in heaven. That's the time he should have remembered. And the second person came, temptation came, he denied the Lord, and the third 
short time he denied the lord and now as jesus looked at him jesus said simon simon satan desires to have you that may sift you like wheat but have prayed for you he forgot that jesus had said that satan wanted to a kind of a sift him like wheat but eventually he remembered and peter remembered the words of jesus which he said unto him before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice and he went out and wept bitterly not just wept not cockerel tears he wasn't weeping to impress anybody he wasn't weeping to attract sympathy he was weeping because he actually saw that he had done what he shouldn't have done and it says he wept bitterly that's the kind of brokenness and that is the kind of repentance that brings a person out of sin and brings him to the savior we come to point number two here point number two we're looking at profitable patience for triumph over trials in james chapter one verse three knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh patience the trying trial of your faith worketh patience when we read the scriptures we look at the scripture and then we compare what we read with our personal lives have you gone through trials before yes have you gone through challenges before yes has your faith been tried before yes but the next question is has each worked patience in your life perseverance in your life has it wrought a kind of work in you the people will say looks like this brother has improved he's not as impatient as he used to be he's not as boisterous as he used to be he's not as self-confident as he used to be looks like the trial the, ch the challenges that this sister has gone through has made her true. You know, she's not as quick as she used to be. She's not as fast as she used to be. Now, she walks slowly. She's more matured. The trials that came, the challenges that came, has changed her demeanor, her, her conduct, her disposition. Now she walks quietly. She is not as loud as she used to be, boisterous as she used to be, acting like a militant man as she used to be. She's softened because of what she's gone through. That's what the trial ought to do in our lives, knowing not this that the trying the trial of your faith worketh patience we're looking at profitable patience perseverance for triumph over trials three things we're looking at number one number one perceiving the test of faith in our trials when trials come that you understand this is a test we've been going through studies They've been going through classes. They've been through, going through programs. Now, at the end of the teaching and the exhortation and the classes we've been having, uh, we're going for test now. And you understand, this is to test. And if you are tested, you must remember everything you have learned in the class. And as we go through tests in life, will bring back to mind everything we have learned from the time of salvation to sanctification to Holy Ghost baptism and to the time of studying the Word of God perceiving the test of faith in our trials number two preserving the testimony of the faithful during trial I have a testimony 
and I must keep that testimony. Look at this trial. The trial wants to make a mess of my profession. The trial wants to make a, a, a mess of my testimony. I'm saved. Great testimony. I'm sanctified and I follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. And Satan has heard my testimony. He wants to make a mess rubbish of my testimony. And so I know that and I perceive that and I want to preserve the testimony of the faithful during my trials. Number three, progressing in our tasks to the full despite trials uh, you don't tell uh, you know the, before the trials came up you were galloping you are you know have been the tip the, the, the peak of the mountain in mind and you're saying i am getting there i am going there now trials come and there's no progress anymore trials come and then we cannot do what we promised what we consecrated we're going to do no you're so careful you're so watchful that you are making progress of the task that the Lord has given you to the full despite the trials. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at perceiving the test in all our trials, the test of faith. We're looking at First Peter chapter 1. We're reading from verse 7. In First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 7, that the trial of your faith being more precious than of gold that perishes. Think about the people that mine gold and they put them inside the furnace and the heat until it becomes liquid until they can see their image on the molten gold and they keep on doing that then they bring it out and make it to the shape they want it to be and that's about a faith a faith is so precious precious of the lord and precious for getting to heaven that even though it is tried it is so that all the dirty things all the oars o-r-e all the oars may be out of that of that faith that there is sin and it says the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ at the appearing of Christ before the Lord comes even though your faith is tried your faith will not be burnt up and your faith will keep on shining be, keep on being purified until he comes you know you're wondering uh, uh, this uh, kind of family i have why is my wife doing like this okay i will divorce her if you do that you do not understand the trying of your faith that the trial is to make your faith perfect until the appearing of the Lord. Why is this man acting to me like this? Looks like maybe he has another eye outside. Maybe he said, uh, you know, somebody is attracting his attention. All right. If he's interested in somebody else outside, I really see him. I divorce him. Your faith has been tried and you are not overcoming and the faith now is burnt up and it is not remaining until the appearing of Christ. But when you say whatever they do, whatever they say, however the in-laws behave, however the man himself behaves, is coming, you know, home now later than usual. Whatever he does, he may say, I'm going to give up faith. I'm going to give up the teaching of one man, one woman, until that do us part. No, I will not give up. And when he comes, I greet him with a smile. I don't get angry. I don't begin a fight. If you get angry and begin a fight, it's like you're like him. You're losing your faith. But when you stand and you stand in faith that whatever he does, whatever she does, you're able to keep your conviction 
and you're able to keep on loving him like Christ wants you to love your wife or to love your husband, then your faith being tried like trying gold with fire is standing. Your faith will stand in Jesus' name. And if you're here, sister so-and-so has packed out of her home. Yes, she had trial in that home. But she was not able to stand. Her faith had been tried. The faith was burnt up. If you hear that uh, brother so-and-so has, you know, packed out of the house and is not able to stay, it's because he has trial in that home. And because of the trial in the home, the faith is burnt up. He cannot stand. I will stand. I will stand. You will stand in Jesus' name. That's how we know the brethren. That's how we know the believers. That's how we know the people who really believe in the Lord. And during time of trial, temptation, test, they remain, they remain firm until the very end, until the appearance of Christ. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says over here, whom have been not seen ye love in whom though now ye see him not ye be yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable full of glory have you ever rejoiced with joy unspeakable when you maybe when you have a child joy unspeakable when you have a husband joy unspeakable when you have a wife joy unspeakable when you've got a new job joy unspeakable when you go out and a land that somebody says something large money large into account joy unspeakable Aye, but when there's trial difficulty what is challenge? How about when, you know, things, you know, you cannot make ends meet? How about when people ridicule you? And when people insult you, assault you, do you have that same kind of joy? That's where sanctification lies. That even though you have those challenges, yet you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Look at verse 9. In verse 9 it says, Receiving the end of your faith, the purpose of your faith, the reason for your faith, even the salvation of your soul we're looking at chapter 4 first peter chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 12 in first peter chapter 4 verse 12 beloved think it not strange concerning the fairy trial which is to try you consider it not a strange thing uh, i wonder what's up mean I'm still in the church, we're still in the church, and we're still hearing the same word of God. And this person keeps coming and keeps coming to the church. And yet, look at what he's doing to me. Look at what she is doing to me. And then you begin to judge. I did not hear him. I pitied the pastor preaching and preaching all his heart out. And these people are still doing like this to me. You're pitying yourself. You're pitying yourself that even though you come to church, and you're expecting uh, people should look like this and do like this. Look at the way they are acting. You're pitying yourself, but it's a beloved. Think it not strange concerning the furry trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing uh, happened uh, unto you. Look at verse 13. Uh, in verse 13, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. In verse 14, in verse 14, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, you're saying, and thank God I'm saved. I thank God I'm living the victorious life. I thank God because I don't have any, you know, any debts on my hand. I do not have any other property, anybody's money in my pocket. I have, you know, I'm living above board. I'm living above reproach. And yet, this comes to you. It says, if you be reproached 
for the name of Christ. You say, what have I done? I've examined my life. I've examined my attitude. I've examined everything I do. I've not done anything wrong, and yet they reproach me. And then uh, you're sorrowful, you're moody, you hang your head, and you, you don't associate with anybody. There's no socializing with anybody. The, be, the good I do, the better I do things, and the more I approach them with the love of Christ, the more they still reproach me. You are not having a right attitude. Look at this. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Not moody, not withdrawn, not isolated, not planning to do evil. Okay, I've done good and they do that. I think what they expect is that I shall strike them back. Okay, I'll strike them back. There you are. You lose your faith. But it says, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you he, on their part. He is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Amen. We're looking at verse 15 there. In verse 15, it says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief was an evil doer, was a busy body in other men's matters. Verse 16, in verse 16, yet if any man, any believer, any, any woman suffer as a Christian, as a Christian, uh -uh, do Christians suffer? Yes, we suffer persecution. Yes, we suffer misinterpretation. We suffer misunderstanding. We suffer the uh, kind of carnality of people and the childishness of people. You know, there are childish people. There are thoughtless people. They don't think of their action. All they do is just to please themselves. They want to please their flesh and please their thoughts. And we suffer as a result of that. And yet we keep our ground and we hold our ground. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You glorify God. Look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at preserving the testimony of the faithful during trials. During trials, you want to preserve whatever testimony you've given in the past. Since I came to know the Lord by the grace of God, I've been living consistently. Keep that testimony during your trial. Since I came to know the Lord, praise the Lord, no shady deals has come in my hand. And whatever money comes, if it is blood money, I reject. I'm not so eager for gifts and for money that I will soil my hands. If that's the testimony you are being given at the time of trial, are you out of job now? Are you penniless now? Keep the testimony that you have always got that I'm not, you know, so eager to get give from anybody that I overlook their lifestyle. I overlook the work they do. I overlook the things they do. I'm not so eager for flattery that I will just accept whatever people are saying. If they're saying something, something wrong and they're putting you on a pedestal, well, you know that you have not been there. But you're so hungry for flattery that whatever they say, you just accept, you lose your testimony. But you keep your testimony. He doesn't care for that. He doesn't worry about that. He doesn't mind whatever. Whatever happens, he has a testimony of the faithful to protect, preserving the testimony of the faithful during trials. In Romans chapter 5, looking at verse 3, Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 3, and not only so, but 
we glory in temptations also. You know, as we read about all these Christians, whether it's Peter, whether it's Paul, whether it's James, all they are telling us is that don't be so moody and don't be so withdrawn and don't be so isolated and don't be so emotional it says all of them telling us we joy we rejoice and we glory it says and not only so but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience look at verse 4 in verse 4 it says some patience experience it says that's how we get experience to live in all conditions that's how we get experience to live with all kinds of people and yet we're able to live the Christian life we might be in Judah like Daniel Shadrach Meshach and Abednego we live the life we ought to live. We might come to Babylon and things are different in Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to threaten this or that, yet we're consistent the way we ought to live so that we're having experience, experience in every state of life every situation in life, every area of our lives. No matter who we're living with, uh, since you became a Christian, you might have lived with, you know, some people that you are familiar with. Then later you came to another place and you're living there and they didn't understand you at the beginning. How would they understand? Because they didn't understand what vows you had made, what consecrations you had made, what commitments you had made. And because they didn't understand, uh, they walked by sight and not by faith. And they kind of injured you one way or the other. But you're having experience, experience, experience every time. Uh, no, what, no matter what is happening. And patience works experience. And experience hope. Then in verse 5, uh, in verse 5 it says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at progressing in our tasks to the full despite trials progressing in the tax he has given us and we progress to the full. We're not stopping halfway. I cannot do that because the trials are too many. I'm trying to nurse my wound. I'm trying to treat myself. I'm trying to, you know, get above all these stormy waters. So I cannot do anything now. It says we we'll keep on making progress in our task to the full, despite the trials. We're looking at um, Acts chapter 20, and I'm reading from verse 24. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. It tells us in verse 24, but none of these things move me. None of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. They talk of their lives, their self-esteem, their self-respect. Oh, they say, yes, I'm a Christian, but I must protect my self-esteem. I must protect my self-respect. And if I come across anyone that doesn't show respect, and he looked down, belittle me, I'm trying to defend that. No, Paul the Apostle said, none of those things move me. Neither count I my life, my honor, my self-respect, my self-esteem dear unto myself so that I might finish my cause with joy. Joy, joy, joy again. That he is, Paul the Apostle said, if I begin to look at them and look at their faces, and taking their action, if I begin to look at that, uh, I may still be walking. I may still be, you know, running here, running there, but it will not be with joy. Paul the Apostle said, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with 
joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus and to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. I pray that this same attitude and mindset the Lord will give everyone in Jesus' name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Seeing we have received this ministry, Paul the Apostle saying, Me of all people, I persecuted the church and I did many things against this name of Christ that he even saved me, forgave me. That would have been enough. But that he saved me, he sanctified me, he gave me the power, baptizing me, the Holy Ghost, and he called me into ministry. Me of all people, he said, I've received this ministry and I have this ministry I faint not. What could have made him to faint? Look at verse 8. In verse 8, he says, We are troubled on every side. He says, I go there, and I thought maybe because I was in location A. That's why I had the trouble. I come to location B, and I'm troubled. I say, okay. Then I go to location C, and the same trouble. Why? <laughs> Paul, you know more than I do. Satan is everywhere. Satan is in location A, location B, location D. He goes to and fro and he follows you everywhere. And so he said, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair look at verse 9 in verse 9 persecuted but not forsaken cast down but not destroyed and then in verse 16 in verse 16 it says for which cause we faint not but though our outward man perish yet the inward man is renewed day by day Day. And then in verse 17, it says, For our light affliction, shipwreck, light affliction, false brethren, um, it's light affliction, and all the things they want. They even stoned him somewhere. And it says, All is light affliction, but uh, for our light affliction, which is for a moment, work it for us, if I'm more exceeding an eternal wage of glory. How? Look at verse. 18 it says while we look not at the things which are seen it says i don't look at those things you know after being stoned all the stones around he said i don't look at them it's like when a snake has beaten somebody and the poison of the snake is in the flesh. Instead of looking for a bandage to bandage that thing so you can restrict the poison of the snake, he leaves the poison there and is looking for the snake and looking for the snake. And meanwhile, the poison is going through to the rest of the body until it gets to the heart of the man. Don't do that. When something like that has happened, don't look at the snake and don't look for the snake. Look for the solution. He said, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. The grace of God, that's what we're looking at. The glory of God, that's what we're looking at. And the promises of God, that's what we're looking at. And it says, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 1. In Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 1, it says, Wherefore seen we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience, perseverance, the race that is set before us look at verse 2 in verse 2 it says it says uh, looking 
unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, for the joy, the joy, the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners. Sinners will contradict themselves. They're still sinners. They still say negative things. But the negative things they are saying to show their own truth, they are contradictory. And yet Jesus endured the contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. In verse 28, in verse 28, it says, Wherefore, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably, acceptably with reverence and godly fear. We're coming to point number three. Point number three, we're looking at prevailing prayer of the triumphant over tribulations. In James chapter 1, reading from verse 4, it says, And let patience have a perfect work, that she may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing, lacking nothing. Three things we're looking at. Number one, number one, we're looking at patiently perfecting our faith against tribulations. Number two, prayerfully prevailing by faith over all tribulations. Number three, purposefully proclaiming the faith, despising tribulations. Look at number one. Number one, patiently, perseveringly, perfecting our faith against tribulations. It tells us in, um, in um, John chapter 16, verse 33. In John chapter 16, verse 33, this says, have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace in the world ye shall have a tribulation in the world ye shall have a tribulation why did god why would god permit that in the world ye shall have a tribulation you know our constitution is such that if the world is so friendly and the world is so cool and the world is so nice and the world is so understanding our constitution has the tendency of going more and more into the world they love me they like me they appreciate me they take care of me they praise me they flatter me and so we forget ourselves so god allows the world to be the world and when the world shows you their side then if you are trying to you know fall for them and love them and and be like them you are cautioned you are told that world is like you know there's tribulation in the world there's trial in the world and it gets you back to prayer it gets you back to the lord it says in the world you shall have tribulation but be of good cheer i have overcome the world he has overcome the world your world in particular that may try to press you up and uh, that may try to soak you in and get the good thing out of you. It makes them to show their true colors so that you will, you will say, I don't think I ought to be too much there. I don't think I need to spend quality time there. I think I need to come back to prayer and come back to my chambers and come back to the throne of grace because out there there's too much fire burning there is too much tribulation and we come to the lord and in the lord we have the triumph we're looking at number two here number two we're looking at prayerfully prevailing by faith over all 
tribulations in uh, Acts chapter 14 reading from verse 22 Acts chapter 14 verse 22 confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God the God of this world will not make it too easy for you to okay um, you are brother so and so okay go ahead <laughs> not bother you you want to go to heaven and I don't have the chance to get to that heaven. You want to make it to glory, and I don't have the chance to move to glory. Okay, I envy you, but go ahead. Satan will never do that. He wants to make it as tough as possible, as difficult as possible, because he knows you are born again joyfully. You are traveling to glory. It's going to bring temptation. That's why it says that Paul the apostle confirmed the soul of the brethren and he says uh, that they should continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God I will enter in Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 we're looking at verse 35 Romans chapter 8 verse 35 who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation the very first thing he mentioned he said uh, there are things trying to separate us wanting to separate us endeavoring and making all efforts to separate us from christ from the love of christ he says shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword in verse 36 it says as it is reaching for thy sake we are killed all the day long we are accountable counted a sheep for slaughter. Verse 37, it says, Nay, in all these things were more than conquerors. In all these things, not outside these things, in all these things, in the tribulation, in the persecution, in the necessities and the things that come across our way, in all these things were more than conquerors through him that loved us look at verse 38 in verse 38 it says for i am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come verse 39 it says no height no death nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of, of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. We're looking at number three here. Number three, purposefully proclaiming the faith, despising tribulations. Purposefully proclaiming the faith, the faith that saves the faith that prepares the hearers for heaven, purposely, fully uh, proclaiming that, despising, uh, belittling uh, all those tribulations and trials and troubles and temptations. In Acts chapter 26, reading from verse 16, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Always remember why Christ appeared unto you, the purpose for this purpose. Always remember why you heard the message of salvation and you were saved for this purpose. Always remember why he called you to be his servant, to be a soul winner, to be a minister, to be a preacher of the word. Always remember, and Paul the apostle always remembered, he said, I remember the Lord said unto me, rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister, 
and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee look at verse 17 in verse 17 delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee verse 18 to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness unto light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and uh, inheritance among them uh, which are sanctified by faith that is in me look at verse 19 uh, it says whereupon O King Agrippa I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. He appeared unto me. I heard him. He gave me a commission. And he told me what to do, proclaiming the faith that will save the people, the Gentiles, and whatever tribulation, I despise them. O King Agrippa, I have not been disobedient unto the heavenly vision. The same grace that Paul the Apostle had, he had granted to you in Jesus name and the same foresight and the same fervency and the same passion and the same perseverance following the Lord and proclaiming the faith with purpose of mind cleaving to the Lord the Lord grant unto you in Jesus name let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer let's take what he has taught us today to the Lord in prayer there are temptations but the grace of God is sufficient for you there are trials but the grace of God is sufficient for you. There are tribulations too, but the grace of God is sufficient unto you. Why don't you just call on the Lord and say, Lord, you helped others, you will help me. What have you had today? What have you learned today? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Have a proper perception of the temptations you might have. Be vigilant, be sober, and don't take things for granted perception in times of temptation you know that temptations come to believers and you have that profitable perseverance you're patient you're triumphant in your trials talk to the Lord pray unto him get a strength the might, the power by which you will overcome. Prevailing prayer. That's what makes us triumphant. Praying, claiming the promises of God. He made others overcome. And he'll make you overcome. Common temptation that comes to all men and he makes a way to escape you are thoughtful you think of your eternal destiny you won't allow any temptation to take eternal life from you a test of faith when you are going through a test you concentrate your minds will not be here and there perceiving the test of faith in our trials and you are joyful you don't go around with long face, gloomy face, isolating yourself. Lonely and being alone, avoiding the people.
test. And you're so in deal to preserve your testimony. The testimony of the faithful. Remember what victory you had in the past? What commitment you had in the past? What consecration, concentration your art in the past. And what testimonies people are giving about you, about your constancy, your consistency. So persevere in whatever you are going through now so that you'll preserve that testimony of the faithful. Are you making progress? In the task the Lord has given you to the full despite the trials. You're not saying I'm going through much because of that. I'm so discouraged. I cannot move on. No, that's not you. That's not your life. Despise the trials. Overlook the trials. Belittle the trials. Don't make the devil or the followers of Satan feel they can be so strong as to hinder you, as to impede, slow down your journey. Don't allow the tempter to feel is stronger than your helper, stronger than the Christ who lives in you. Don't give any human being of flesh and blood the wrong notion that they are higher, stronger than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in your life. Lift Jesus higher, higher than the God of this world. Patiently, you're perfecting your faith Increasing your faith, growing your faith against all tribulations. Prayerfully, you prevail by faith over all temptations and trials and tribulations. When last did you smile at the storm? When last did you laugh at the tempter, at the temptress? When last did you exude joy, excitement, happiness in the face? of trial and tribulation. When last did you have joy unspeakable in the midst of trial? Have you proclaimed the faith this new year? Have you preached the gospel this new year? Have you excitedly, passionately, joyfully, cheerfully declared the gospel this new year? Or are you drawn back by, this is a new year and I don't have this, I don't have that? 
and you are showing a gloomy face to the devil and he is rejoicing that he can make you miserable the joy you ought to have you pass it on to the hand of the devil take it back joy gladness happiness take it back and serve the Lord joyfully proclaiming the gospel following up on the converts serving the Lord with joy don't allow that unbelieving wife to, to feel she can make you cry you come back from church you hear the exciting message of the word of God and then a sinful woman unbelieving woman will think that she can take the joy of the Lord away from your heart don't allow her to feel triumphant overpowering you be happy I will look at things which are not seen and we jettison. We overlook the things which are seen. Don't allow the unbelieving man to think he is so mighty and that his own attitude can be so disturbing as to make you forget the joy you just got in the house of God. Don't allow any mortal man, any mortal woman to have the wrong notion that I can do anything that will take the grace, the joy, the happiness, the gladness of the Lord away from your heart. Live with joy. Live with gladness and happiness. Lift up the consecration you are making to the Lord. Make that higher than any circumstance in your life. In Jesus' name we pray. The Lord has answered your prayer. Father, we thank you, we appreciate you. Thank you for calling us into the faith. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for our experience in the Lord. We're asking, Lord, that the joy of salvation will remain and abide in every saved soul in Jesus' name. Those who have not been saved, Lord, I pray that at this time, they'll have the repentance of a broken heart. Turn away from sin. Give up all the evil in their hands and have a the real salvation that brings joy, that brings transformation, that brings new life into every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I pray the grace to overcome, the grace to endure, and the grace to keep on abiding in the Lord, whatever the temptation, whatever the trial, whatever the tribulation, grant the grace to everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. When temptations come, Lord, make us so sober, so vigilant that we resist steadfast in the faith in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that the victory, the triumph 
of a real child of God that nothing will take away the victory the triumph you have given us grant us that grace and that strength and that power in Jesus name we're going back home watch over every one of us all the brethren here all the brethren everywhere as we go back to our homes your promises will be yes and amen, amen. the victory will be definite the triumph will be definite and lord when we come back again we'll come back with testimony amen. that the things that used to put her back on the wall now we are standing amen. the things that auto caught that, that, that used to cause depression and distress and sorrow that now we're so happy and excited we're living the victorious life happily and joyfully in jesus name and help us lord to bring other people to this same joy to this same victory and to this same triumph and we come with them to the next fellowship in our districts and to a combined service in jesus name all that you have promised and purpose for every one of your children this year blessing upon blessing victory upon victory and lord your promises will be yes and amen in every life in jesus name confirm it in every life thank you lord for the answer in jesus name we pray Amen.